life. If you want to learn how to do something new, you actually have to stick your neck out and try it. And you're going to fail. I know I've certainly failed a lot of times with virtually everything I've done from, gosh, learning how to walk. That that was a challenge for all of us, wasn't it? But yet we're all walking on two legs upright most of the time. If you can learn to do that, you can learn to do technology. You can also learn to have a better marriage. You can make more sense of that guy that you live with. My audience today, I assume, is going to be predominantly female. But if there are some men here, you are very welcome. Today, we're going to talk about the boy code, which is what every man has learned by the time he's five years old. And this really sets the foundation for a lot of issues that women have with men when uh, they're in a marriage, is that men are adhering to this boy code that they have been brought up with, that they've been told, this is how you live life. This is what makes for a healthy human being. And we get the women in there and they're like, why are you acting that way? Well, it's because that's what they've been told is the way men should act. This is, like I said, this is predominantly geared towards women to help us understand more what men experience as they're growing up. That we already know men and women are different, but how we're different is pretty important to understand because when it comes right down to it, we tend to act like we're not different. We tend to try to get guys to behave the way we think they should, which essentially would be turning them into women. And we don't want that to happen. So we need to understand what those differences are and why they're important. First of all, there's the biology of emotions. You know, we are biologically different. I mean, you can tell that just by looking at a man and a woman that, you know, uh, we have different body parts. We'll put it that way. But our brains are also different. We are formed not only by our genetics, but by our environment to uh, experience and respond to things in different ways. Now, we can get into the biology of the brain more deeply at some point in time, but just know for now that men actually experience every emotion that we do, and they experience them actually more intensely than we do. The problem is that their environment teaches them not to express those emotions So the experience is the same, but the expression is very different. The other thing that's very different is that men are sensitive to different things than women are. Women are sensitive to getting their feelings hurt. Men are more sensitive to things that attack their identity as men. So we're going to dive into that a little deeper today as well. The process that men go through in changing from little sensitive boys into grown-up men who seem to be insensitive, with the emphasis on they seem to be insensitive, is pretty traumatic, actually. If you've got a picture of your husband when he was about five, I would like you to hold that picture in your mind as we're talking today. But also, if you don't have a picture of him, maybe you've got a child that's about that age or you know of a little boy about that age. And just hold on to that picture and imagine you've got this incredibly sensitive little human being who's sensitive to his mom, who's sensitive to, you know, hurting other people. Little boys are in incredibly empathic towards other kids. Imagine that and then imagine him being pushed away. Imagine him being shamed. Imagine him experiencing that day after day after day for his entire life. It's a huge deal. We go from, you know, cuddly, warm, sweet little boys that we just love to hold on to to big boys don't cry to suck it up or (laughs) like I used to say in sports rub some dirt on it and get on with the game that's really a huge part of this developmental trauma that kids go through and 
it's particularly difficult when there's not a father there to show the boy how to negotiate that transition. So um, that's another topic for another day as well. But it is something that virtually every man goes through. It's the process of shaping behavior. And shaping behavior is critically important. Women's behavior is shaped as well, but in very different ways. What you do predominantly to shape people is you use behavioral psychology. That means that people are either rewarded or punished for um, the behavior that those around them find acceptable. Not a bad idea. It's the way that life works. But in the process of shaping a little boy, there seems to be an excessive use of something called shame. And shaming is um, socially acceptable for little boys, where it's not so acceptable for little girls. The research that I'm going to be talking about mostly today has to do with what I learned from a book called Real Boys. And this was published, gosh, I should have looked it up. It was in the the late 90s, I believe. And there certainly has been a lot of transition over the last 20 years. But this is predominantly true for guys that are probably in their mid-40s and older. This would be something that you've experienced a lot. If you want to understand what little boys go through, I highly encourage you to get this book. It's available on Amazon. And he actually tells stories of observing real boys in real situations and seeing how they're treated, seeing how they are, uh, how people react to them, uh, just really what their experience is. And it, parts of it are really, really heartbreaking to hear what's going on in, in these boys in classrooms and such. You know, I don't want to dive into that too much today because I'll get off topic, which I have a tendency to be able to do really well. I can get, there's just so much information I want to share. The boy code that he talks about in here is actually four different mandates or four different commandments for how to be a boy, how to grow into a man. And the first one of those is you have to be a sturdy oak. That simply means that you can't whimper, you can't cry, you can't complain or show any sign of weakness. It's totally forbidden. And if you do show any of those things, you can count on people coming down on you and shaming you for it. That's the big boys don't cry. You know, come on, you can do it. Suck it up, get over it, um, move on. So this is driven deep into this little guy's soul. By the time he's five, you know, when he's three, it's still kind of okay to do that. But by the time he gets into kindergarten, which is usually five years old, he figures out, you know what, if I, if I whimper or cry in the playground, somebody is going to make fun of me and I don't want anybody to make fun of me. So I'm going to hide that part of myself. It's not that they don't still feel those feelings. It's that the freedom to express them has been taken away. A man then must appear to be tough and independent if he wants to be loved and respected. Now, we've all heard a lot from guys about wanting to be respected, but he thinks that if he's anything less than tough and independent, that he will lose respect, especially in the eyes of the women that he loves. Keep that in mind. So be a sturdy oak is our first mandate for boys. The second one is give them hell. This means that risky behavior is actually encouraged. I actually remember a story of my grandson getting in trouble in preschool because he was playing superheroes on the playground and he was being Mr. Macho and jumping off the slide on the side, which is not a very safe thing to do. So he got in trouble for that. But it was highly rewarding to him to behave that way. He watched superhero movies. He loved the whole idea. I, he was so funny because he went through a whole period of time where he insisted on being called Peter Parker when he wasn't being called Spider-Man. So uh, it was really funny. I think it was about three and a half or four when that happened. But he got in trouble in preschool because he was engaged in this 
risk-taking behavior. But the other thing is that it's also so incredibly rewarding to little boys to do that kind of behavior. They get pleasure from using the big muscle groups. They are stronger than women. We talked about their brains being different and about them being sensitive. But we also need to realize that their physical bodies are designed to be stronger than a woman's. And so they've got to learn how to channel all of that emotional energy into something productive. And one of the ways they do that is through play. It's through being the superhero. You know, I don't think I ever, no, I never saw my grandsons or my sons try to play the villain. They usually made their friend the villain if they needed a villain in the story. The idea was that I'm going to do all of these great things and I need to be a superhero with superpowers to do it. So that's the idea of, of give them hell is like, you know, get out there and be invincible. It's a great esteem builder in many ways, right? Then the idea of be the big wheel. That means that you dominate others and you refuse to let anybody know that you feel like a failure or like life is out of control. Again, we're back to hiding the feelings. The competition between boys on sports teams and such, they all want to be the best. They can't all be the best. And they know they can't be the best. So the next best thing to being the best is to hide those feelings that you feel like you're not, you're not getting there. And men do that as well. Adult males also hide that feeling like life is out of control and I'm failing at it. When they do that, that's oftentimes when they get involved into numbing type activities something that seems as innocuous as watching sports on TV or something as dangerous as, you know, doing drugs or alcohol, those kinds of things. They're all numbing behaviors to help a guy cope with these vulnerable feelings that he's just not able to be the best, be the top. It's, it's a rough place to be for sure. And then the last one, the last of these four mandates is no sissy stuff is allowed. That means that you are to express any feelings or urges that could be viewed as feminine, such as dependence, warmth, or empathy. So it isn't that they don't feel that. It isn't that they don't feel the tenderness, the tender feelings, but that they're not allowed to express those. A man also has to figure out his own problems. He gets taught early on that if if you've got a problem, you need to go over there and figure out what to do about it. And that means dealing with those vulnerable emotions such as anger, sadness, fear, hurt, grief, shame, guilt, and doubt. He's all, you know, trying to figure that out on his own. And that's the big part behind the man cave that I've talked about in other videos is that the man goes in there because he's been trained. You've got to figure this out. You can't depend on anybody else. You're, you're the sturdy oak. You're the big wheel. You're uh, all of these things that you've got to hold it together. And so you need to go over here by yourself and figure that out. Now, I don't know that that's such a bad idea because it encourages men to do their very best and to be the leader that I think they're capable of being. Men have very different qualities than women do. We can talk about that at another time, too. There's some interesting research on personality traits that are more dominant in men and more dominant in women. Those are going to be important conversations for us to have as well. There's good parts of the boy code, there's bad parts, and then there's just plain ugly parts to the boy code. The boy code actually prepares a boy for manhood. It helps him get ready for the life that he needs to lead as a physically strong, intelligent human being with different skill sets, with a different way of looking at the world than his wife and children do. It prepares him for that. It allows him, it's like, you can be uh, strong and independent. And this is a good thing. You know, we don't want uh, to take all of the energy 
away from this very strong human being, and I'm talking physically strong, because they just, I mean, there, yeah, there are some women that are stronger than some men, but as a group, men are stronger, and they put themselves out there, predominantly in the military, in law enforcement, in, you know, fire and rescue. We have a lot of men, and one of the reasons that they're drawn to that is that they have this desire to get in there and solve problems and protect people and take care of them, and they have the physical ability to do that. I don't think I could pick a car up off of a railroad track and move it out of the way of an oncoming train. We saw that video clip at one of the women's workshops that I did in California, uh, gosh, what was that, two years ago now? But there's a scene in this film where these men all rally around. And they're, they, I think there's probably about eight of them that do it. But I can't imagine eight women being able, the same number of women being able to pick this car up and move it off the tracks like these guys do. It's just, And they're willing to risk that. There's a train coming at them. And yet there are two girls that are trapped in the car and they need to get it off the tracks. And so they're willing to risk. They're a lot more willing to risk things like that than women are. Now, I have to say that, you know, we've got the whole mother bear thing going on, too, that if a woman is, someone comes after her child, I mean, she will face anything to protect her child. But men go a step farther in that, and that they have that physical strength, but they also are willing to save just about anybody. And I don't know that women are willing to do that. Maybe some of us are, but uh, we're more likely to hold back unless it's one of our children. But I think that's the good part of the boy code is that it helps to shape and channel that emotional sensitivity and that physical strength into being the kind of leader that can protect and provide, problem solve and please his family. You know, these guys also, I mean, every time I go into a big city, you can see it here too in the small town where I live, but I think about it more in a big city. Virtually everything that you see, all of those buildings are because some man thought of it and other men were willing to go out there and risk their physical safety to make it happen. Women are not as willing to go out and work in those conditions whether, you know, the weather, I mean, I don't want to be out working in the cold. I think about that when I see road crews, you know, building the, the highway and being out there in the middle of the night because they don't want to be stopping all the traffic and they have those huge floodlights. And here's these men out there working through the night to build a road. I don't know very many women that would want that job. There are some and some do. And, and that's fine. That's a matter of preference. But as a whole, it's the guys that are risking what uh, their physical safety to provide for us in many, many ways. The bad part about this is that a man's wife and his family don't really understand his life experience. And so they tend to judge him, sometimes shame him and put him down because he doesn't think like a woman. That that's the bad part, but it, it actually gets worse. We don't understand, I back up a little bit before I talk about the worst part. We don't understand what he thinks. We think he's not thinking at all. Probably the biggest complaint I get from women is like, how can he not look around the house and see things that need to be done? That just doesn't make sense to me. I'll say to him, why did you not clean up the living room today? You were home all day long. And he'll go, what do you mean? It looks fine to me. So we don't know what he's thinking, but he is thinking. He's just thinking about different things. We also don't know what he feels because, or how he feels, because he doesn't tell us. And that's where we get to be detectives. And this is a huge part that I help women with all the time, is how do you recognize what a man's feeling? And how do you know how to respond to that? Because he does feel. Also, why he does what he does instead of other things. Men actually have very logical reasons for doing the things they do. It makes sense to them, but it doesn't always make sense to us. 
And that's uh, where we get into the trouble of the ugly and the ugliest shame. So I want to talk a little bit more about shame because it's so important. And the number one person, if you follow Dr. Brene Brown, you know, her primary research was on shame. She also found out that vulnerability is really essential for healthy relationships. And in that process, she ended up experiencing shame herself. Uh, she did a, a very famous TED Talk on vulnerability. Uh, she says, shame for women is this web of unobtainable, conflicting, competing expectations about who we're supposed to be. And it's a straitjacket. For men, shame is not a bunch of competing, conflicting expectations. Shame is one. Do not be perceived as what? Weak. I did not interview men for the first four years of my study. It wasn't until a man looked at me after a book signing and said, I love what you say about shame. I'm curious why you didn't mention men. And I said, I don't study men. And he said, that's convenient. And I said, why? And he said, because you say to reach out, tell your story, be vulnerable. But you see those books you just signed for my wife and my three daughters? I said, yeah. They'd rather me die on top of my white horse than watch me fall down. When we reach out and be vulnerable, we get the shit beat out of us. And don't tell me it's from the guys and the coaches and the dads, because the women in my life are harder on me than anyone else. So I want to keep that in mind as we talk about shame and we continue to move forward with this. This is really a powerful clip and probably most people that have watched her talks, unless you happen to be a man, may have just skipped over that whole piece there, which was only about two minutes long, but it's really powerful and it says a lot about the routine experience for men. Shame thrives, according to Dr. Brown. Shame thrives in secrecy, silence, and judgment. She goes on to say that in the rest of this clip. And that's really true. The, the part that I love that she says, is she also tells how it cannot exist. And shame cannot exist in the presence of something very, very simple that we all need to learn how to do, and that is empathy. Men don't get empathy from anybody, and when they get empathy from their wives, it often feels like more shaming. So we need to really understand what that looks like. How do you give a man empathy without making him feel like a little boy? You know, I had a, a couple one time in my counseling office I asked him to comfort her. He pulled her in under his arm and held her. And I asked her, how did that feel? And she said, it felt great. Then I said to her, I said, now you comfort your husband. And so she, you know, sat up a little straighter and she put her arm over his shoulder and, you know, tried to hold him that way. And I said to him, how does that feel? And he said, I feel like a little boy. She was like, well, I'm doing the same thing to you that you did to me. It felt good to me. I don't understand. And I said, so show your wife what it would feel like for you, what position she could get in to make you feel like you were loved and supported. You know what he did? He pulled her back under his arm again. He wanted the warmth of her next to him but he didn't want to feel like he was overpowered. He still wanted to feel like he could protect her even in his vulnerability. And that's the cool thing about guys is that they actually get comfort when they're able to comfort us. But oftentimes we're so busy attacking, blaming, and criticizing them without even realizing that's what we're doing, but we do that and we don't understand that actually disempowers him to do the very thing that you want him to do, which is to comfort you. So comforting your partner, you got to learn how to do that. Learn how to do it well. 
As a result of all this, almost every man leads a life that's filled with quiet desperation. I can't remember who said that originally, but they don't tell anybody about their feelings. Rarely, if ever, does a man receive real empathy from anyone. Guys will give one another empathy. It's usually very brief, depending on how close they are in their friendship. If they have shared experiences, they can give each other just a knowing look, and they and that's empathy for men. Or they can go, sucks, you know, and they know exactly what it means. And they don't use a lot of words. They don't spend a lot of time processing like women do. He does get that empathy from his friends. Um, he doesn't usually get empathy from his mother unless she makes him feel like a little boy. His wife oftentimes doesn't even know that that's what he needs because he has this huge facade up that is the the very confusing to women why he would even need empathy because he doesn't look like he does. He doesn't act like he does. And so we miss it a lot. So what can you actually do to help him? Here's the, the bottom line. Well, pay attention to those nonverbal cues. Learn to read him well. I've got uh, some courses coming up here that I'm working on even now that will help you to understand what those nonverbal cues are and how you specifically can respond to them in ways that make him feel supported by you without adding further shame. Remember, you need to respond to his needs, not yours in those moments. That's really hard to do because we need empathy too as women, for sure. But if we aren't able to reciprocate, we don't know what that looks like going back the other direction, then we can overfocus on what our needs are and totally ignore his, which takes us back to the idea that he's living a life of quiet desperation. And I don't want the man I love to be feeling that way. Any of the men that I love, I've got sons and grandsons, you know, I've got friends. I don't want anyone to feel like they're, they're desperate in life. Another thing you can do is make physical contact. You know, actually, you don't really have to say anything. Remember the story of, of the man who needed comfort and he wanted his wife with her arms around his ribs and, and you know, his arm up over her shoulder and that made him feel comforted. So it it's not coming in and treating him like a baby. It's not definitely not saying poor baby. But it's just touching, and it can be even just reaching out and touching his hand that lets him know that you get it, that you understand that he's having a hard time, and give him empathy. That means simply something like, I can't imagine how hard this is. End of sentence. Don't say any more. You know, another thing you can say is, wow, that really sucks. Don't give him advice, because when you give him advice, it makes him feel like he can't figure it out on his own. He doesn't need your advice. He's not stupid. Despite what a lot of people say about men, they are not stupid. The one thing that he misses is that empathy that you see that he's having a hard time, that he's struggling. So don't treat him like a child. Don't use too many words. You want to keep him very, very short phrases and then stop talking. Uh, don't pressure him to talk. That's another thing that we often think of because if our girlfriend's going through a hard time and we want to give her empathy, then we want to want to encourage her to talk about it because that's how women process things. Men don't. Men process things in a very different way. So pressuring him to talk will just heap more shame on him because he doesn't know the answers. He doesn't know how to talk about it. And again, I go into that more deeply into the courses that are coming out in the next couple of months. And the final thing, please, 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 do not betray his confidence. Don't go tell your girlfriends or your sister or your mother or anything about what he's going through. Keep that to yourself. Let it be between you and your husband or you and the Lord. If you're a Christian and you're praying for him, you can certainly talk about it there. Or if you are in with a counselor or a coach or someone who's also going to keep that confidence, then that's a safe place to do it. But for heaven's sake, don't tell your mom, your sisters, your friends, strangers, don't don't share anything about what he's going through with anyone else, male or female. What else can you do? Well, learn all you can about the man you love. They're very different than we are and very important to understand what those differences are. 
be confident, be confident that you can pull this off. You can learn how to be present for your husband in a way that no one else is. You know, God actually created the woman to be there uh, to kind of save the man from himself. But the way we try to save him is by giving him instruction. And that is not the case at all. Uh, be brave enough to try the things that you learn about who he is and what he needs. Even if it doesn't quite make sense to you in the beginning, be brave enough to give it a try. And then finally, be wise. That means keep learning, keep testing, keep experimenting, keep moving in that direction so that you can learn more and more and more. Discover all the ways that you can inspire him to be the best man that he can possibly be. And if you want to know more resources, of course, you can always visit my website. 